And thanks to the Humanities and Fine Arts Division and the English Department for supporting living writers on campus. Um, I also want, I want to mention before we begin uh, tonight's reading that there's another, uh, there's an event upcoming a week from Thursday, uh, April 14th. Um, in, there'll be a slam poetry reading headlined by S.C. Says as part of No Hate Week and Carthage Student Readers will also be featured if you're a poet that thinks of something that you've written would fit in with that theme, uh, you should join in. And that's April 14th. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome poet and book and paper artist Jordan Dunn, who will read his poems and share his print objects with us, uh, including this beautiful, small book, not so small <laughs> object, uh, made especially in part for the occasion. <clears throat> uh, Jordan Dunn is the author of the chapbooks The Land of Little Rain from Well Greased Press and Form 32 from Cannot Exist, as well as numerous pamphlets and broadsides. His work, oh sorry, he lives in Madison, Wisconsin, where he co-curates the reading series Oscar Presents, and if you're ever in Madison, uh, spend time there, you should not miss it, uh, held in various apartments around town, uh, and also helps direct Polka Press Cooperative. Um, such print objects as these, and there's more that you can see at the end of the reading, um, are the way that I came to first know Jordan uh, and his work. First through uh, broadsides that he made for the Oscar Presents readings, including a uh, broadside of my own work that I was thrilled for him to make, and of James, and uh, who a lot of you have heard me mention, my son, uh, who read, and Lisa, and then lots of great poets who have come through town. And they're beautiful um, objects that reimagine, uh, in many cases, the work. Uh, you know, one writes a poem, and then you sort of work with Jordan, and it becomes this whole other poem, and this whole other piece of art, and it's a, a beautiful process. And he and I are working on another project that I've really been enjoying, too. These print objects presented me with many questions and answers about how a poem can be on a piece of paper, how folds and stitches and ink and impressions and lack of ink and images creates a particular encounter with language. In coming to know Jordan's own work, I've seen how these encounters across, I'm not sure of the word here, across environments maybe, is central to his work, encounters and connections between the language of a poem and its material form. Uh, as, you, as you'll see in a work like this, uh, and then by, I don't have them with me, but another version of some of these poems I've seen, they're on very large pages and the way they shift from it between those spaces. But also in the way text from other works, as we saw in class today, is reprinted and then reworked, maybe worked with in his own pages. And then how those pages are shaped by the encounters, say, walking around the marshes behind Starkweather Creek in Madison, as we did on Sunday, where he showed me some new paths. Uh, and that place felt, in his company, like a new work. There's a connection between the way the pages are and the way walking around uh, in an environment is. Uh, and that afternoon, it felt like walking around was walking around in a poem. And I think that's one of the things that poems give you, is that then you go walk around in the world, and the world is suddenly part of whatever that experience was that you have reading a poem. With that particular intense and relaxed attention. His work explores the spaces around visual poetics, natural history, and ephemera, combining poetry, visual images drawn from natural history texts and other sources. He creates print objects, both digitally and through letterpress painting and other methods, and at the end of the reading, there'll be time for questions and a chance to see some objects more closely uh, both objects that have inspired his own work and op many objects that he's made. Uh, and to look at those, and particularly for those of you who are making chapbooks, we'll talk about making books and how one could, what possibilities there are. Uh, but all are welcome for that. And then uh, I wanted to read, uh, as I did at the last reading, a, a, a little bit from another book. A particularly appropriate for an artist who uses other people's work in a very particular way. Um, and I was kind of looking around my bookshelves thinking of what I should read and I took, uh, first I took down a critique of everyday life <laughs> from Henri Lefebvre's book, uh, which, which would be also great, but then I turned to uh, 
Mallarmé and, and open to this page, and it was full of folds and paper, and it seemed appropriate. So I'd like to just read a paragraph of that as introduction uh, and welcome. When I see a new publication lying on a garden bench, I love it when the breeze flips through the pages and animates some of the exterior aspects of the book. No one, perhaps, since there has been reading, has remarked on this. <laughs> that might be an exaggeration. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that in class, that feeling. Like, he's like the little kid. It's like, nobody's ever noticed this before. Um, this might be an occasion to do so when freed, the newspaper dominates mine, which I put aside. It blows over to a rose hedge where it struggles to cover the blossoms, ardent and proud confabulations unfolds in the flower bed. That's the part especially that I thought of you, unfolds in the flower bed. And I'll leave it there, along with the flower words in their muteness. And technically, I propose to note down now how this discard differs from the book, which is supreme. A newspaper remains the starting point. Literature unburdens itself there as much as it wishes. And then the last little bit. Now, folding is, with respect to the page printed whole, a quasi-religious indication. The large sheets are less striking than the thick stacks of pages, which offer a tiny tomb for the soul. Please welcome Jordan Dunn. <laughs> Uh, I was a little nervous about it because I don't really do it for a living and I didn't know exactly how it was going to turn out. Uh, so I have these book objects for you. Uh, you can keep them after the reading if you'd like, unless you find them to be burdensome, uh, in which case you can <laughs> give them back to me and uh, we'll find someone that will enjoy them. Uh, most of the text uh, I'm going to read tonight comes uh, from this booklet, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, and I don't think I'm going to read it to you necessarily in the order uh, that it is here in the book. In fact, I guarantee you that I won't. Uh, but I don't expect you uh, to listen to me the whole time because I've given you this text to read. Uh, I'd be delighted if you listened to me the entire time, but I'm happy for you to read as I'm reading out loud. Uh, I don't like being the only body in the room making language uh, <laughs> whenever possible. Uh, let me bring you through uh, the booklet a little bit. I guess I don't have one that's stitched, but uh, we can go through it together just for a second. So there's a blank flyleaf page on yours, and then there's uh, a one-page fold. Uh, and then you turn the page, and there's a two-page spread. And then when you turn the page again, there'll be uh, a three-page panel that folds out. Uh, and that's important to know if you want to actually see all of the language. Uh, and then if you turn the page again, there'll be a second fold that comes out into a three-page panel. Uh, and that's where I'm going to start because uh, I wanted to draw your attention to a typo that's in here, <laughs> which I found after I printed it and thought about printing it again for tonight. But I decided it would be an interesting place to start the reading. Because a typo has what I think is kind of an interesting history. Uh, so if you go to the middle panel, uh, there's a stanza, I desire to activate. And then if you go to the stanza next to that, uh, the female girl speak. If you go down to the stanza that begins, my occupation is apprehended by such things, you'll notice that on the next line, the it ha has a space in it. <laughs> this is really interesting to me because I actually was correcting a typo, which was the lowercase it. I went back into the manuscript and put in the capital I, and in doing so, created a space and didn't go back to check it again because I assumed I had done the proofreading. Uh, but it used to read that stanza, as my occupation is apprehended by such things, comma, I turn into a body that must unbind desire. I then changed it, as my occupation is apprehended by such things, period. 
it turns into a body that must unbind desire, in which case I had the lowercase it. My occupation is apprehended by such things, comma, it turns into a body that must unbind desire, or my occupation is apprehended by such things, period. It turns into a body that must unbind desire. I like the capital I in the separation from the T. I wrote here that I mistakenly left it lowercase, but my good friend Andy in proofreading the text found the mistake. And capitalizing the I and it, I put a space there. And so doing printed it like that with the space between the I and the T. I'm very interested in this space, the I and the it, and the it and the I, it only being a space that distinguishes the two. I don't know what to make of the T. Other than that, the T is quite lonely when separated from the I. But the I is quite lonely when joined up with the T. It turns it into something kind of objectified. And the I myself becomes disfigured, a lonely kind of object cast onto the page. Therefore, my occupation is apprehended by such things, period. It turns into a body that must unbind desire as it approaches the melodious tone delineating the forest edge, which itself is unbound from a recognizable placement in the fact of things. When I walk eastward, my anxiety exhibits a snapshot effect upon the landscape. Instead of establishing feelings as movements around the station of discontent, my higher considerations of utility make nothing more than an occupation from my sense of my anxiety, which offers silence to the lead plant. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the lead plant. It's a very lovely prairie plant. Uh, so I just thought I'd read you a little bit uh, from this field guide here, which describes the lead plant, uh, which is in the pea and bean family of plants. Lead plant lacks the butterfly-shaped flower so characteristic of the family. The single petal, petal forms a hood over the lower portion of the stamens, leaving them visible. One of the most important native legumes of the prairie, lead plant was named by early miners in southwestern Wisconsin, to whom the leaden gray hairiness suggested the presence of lead or deposits. Native American tribes used the dried leaves to make tea. Uh, it's interesting that one of the main things that occurred in southwestern Wisconsin during that period was also lead ore mining. Uh, I'll pass this around if you guys want to take a look at the plant, uh, and I'll keep going. Uh, it's, it's marked there. Uh, it absorbs the dignity mown paths to skies in the prairie setting. To establish a weed-free weed -free seabed, Plant the pods separately or in rows to create alternation with grasses when planted 3 16 inches deep in the spring or fall, depending on stratification requirements. I have noted here to turn to an interlude, which I, I have this, so I'll break from the text once again. Uh, now this is part of this manuscript in a different form, which is much longer. Uh, Everything is here as it happens because we are wedded to the flux of life. I want to be sure you can hear me before another epic passes our feelings by, distilling the perch for poplar and crow. When my nervous pieces migrate into this body, I sense some acidity in memory as a cause. Even though the cicada's calling song disrupts the perfect union of my nervous pieces, there exists an exchange between them like thin histories developing side points to vanish within dusk. We can use the alders as a metaphor for excessive pain. If we are able to contain them in an artful way, they may be placed at four or five foot distances before us. And when they have struck root with our measured time, we may cut them, which will cause them to spring out in glorious clumps and shoot out in many useful poles with regard to their pithy essences. Make no mistake. The alder is the most faithful lover of boggy places. In one such place, there exists a road made of cedar logs which follow a railway improvement into disturbing swamps. The road is lined on both sides of alders of healthful appearance growing among tussock sedges. 
A prolonged adventure with the road can sometimes result in the striking itch taking place upon the foot, which can be healed if the alder fruit is beaten with vinegar and applied generously to the affected area with express curiosity. Thus the anxiety of the skin subsides during the adventure, leaving only sun missives to greet memory and familiar bluets in the pieweed. Despite everything, I totally amass privilege while the variations cast outward from my body like fishing lines dependent on agency in milfoil and pondweed, which upon meeting the water startle every single reaction out of the sunfish in their incessant flux. They call it delivery. I call it return. The result is only different if the appearance of differences is integral to the composite's afterglow. I often follow myself outside where I discover you watering snapdragons and accepting the return of shade. I'm going to move to the front panel now uh, if anyone's interested in following along. I'm just going to read this out loud as it appears on the page. Unlike nature, climax models are a thing I enjoy approaching but cannot control. The longest term advantage in identifying a species is the self-regard one exhibits to others. Like basking on a log employed in riparian matters chiefly, a dimensional contribution eliminating the need for secondary growth. The path before us serves as an event horizon that regulates the boundaries of our imagination. What I give out to this demonstration of language will be measured solely by the dissolution of its own beginning and the subject of memory. I remember how the easiest route resulted in my possession of the uplands due to the inundation of the more direct lowlands. Although I approached the opportunity to inhale the impossible splendor earth and ice emits on the north side of cherries while listening to the rapturous exposure tuned by chorus frogs. The cherries are immune to hostile classes of human use due to their immaterial essence in the month of March. And much like the chorus frogs react upon their earthly home without reference to human action as a cause. There was a period when we were abandoned by public harmonies in order to breed successfully in our damage unit. Uh, so for those of you who weren't at the class today, uh, a lot of my poetry uh, is derived from other sources. So I'll, I'll, I'll take other people's writing and incorporate it into my own writing and then disfigure that and reconfigure it. Uh, and so a lot of times the result might seem somewhat confusing. Uh, and to me, it's about, in some way, that undefined space between uh, like absorption of someone else's language into my own writing and the expulsion of that writing out the, out, out the other end. And I felt like if I make my prose and my poetry too clear, I sort of uh, don't leave any artifact of that process. I don't leave any allegiance to the work which I admired, which I incorporated to begin with. Uh, and so some way that I try to retain that is to have a little bit of disfigurement of the text, which is confusion, at least in the way that I enjoy it. Uh, so I'm going to move to the second page here, uh, or, or, or the second fold out. If it's interesting to you to follow along in that way, you can feel welcome. Uh, the left-hand side begins, lichens and mosses first prepare the way. Uh, and I'm going to read from the larger typeface on the right side of the page. The original mind is to lily, is to buckthorn, is to egret, is to cottonwood, is to coot, is to cumulus, is to lily, is to egret, is to lily, is to coot, is to buckthorn, is to you, is to cottonwood, is to cumulus, is to oak, is to me, is to mind, is to lily, is to coot, is to egret, 
is to thyme, is to buckthorn, is to cottonwood, is to you, is to me, is to lily, is to coot, is to egret, is to cottonwood, is to lily, is to my mind, is to oak, is to my mind, is to you, is to oak, is to cottonwood, is to lily, is to buckthorn, is to your buckthorn, is to my cottonwood, is to my lily, is to your coot. The river is to water, is to leaves, is to stalk, is to the reed, is to flower, is to the lotus, is to the comb which wasps do make, is to the thirty cells in which is contained, the center of which grows a bean, is to the cell in which it is contained, is to the bean which is best enjoyed in a fresh green state at dusk with the lotus and the flower, which is to the water, which is to morning, which is to petals, which is to the air, which is to the petals which expand into the charged air. My spirit loses its clarity through detachment where memory is bound up in wildness and multiplies for the right to exist in empty space when laid side by side upon paper. The hills over which I came prepared me to address their absence by silencing my attempt at stillness. How's everyone doing? Thought I'd just check in for a second, maybe have a drink of water, kind of clear the air a little bit. It takes a lot to listen to poetry, I know, because I listen to lots of it. I help host readings. Uh, it's difficult to tune the mind to that space. Uh, so I want to give you guys a breather for a second, and I guess myself too. Maybe I can move around a little bit more. Podiums are strange artifacts. At this place, it could be this place, at this place, let us regard our past lives and the loves inhabiting them like a sweet vicinity ripe with bramble fruit. An absolutely new space is created when I travel in your direction. Consequently, my opportunities and their exclusive pleasures exist distinctly within the idea of you. Subdued in their lightness and outline, but never whimsical in their output. No one has explained to me this difference. If there is a magnetism in nature and I yield to it by choice, will I be led astray into the actual world and travel side by side with perfect symbolism into the interior of the ideal world? Or will I be left alone to withdraw deeply into myself and encounter the buffle heads in retrograde motion? The female grosbeak, that's what my note here tells me to move to. The female grosbeak returns to the feeder daily I am learning how to be quiet with her. Beyond the property line is another property line. So I desire to activate my movement westward, but the pieces prohibit me like sharp edges ascending above matter or sepals. Maybe I'll bend down here and try to use the mic a little bit. The first word is calyx, and it means a covering. When the flowers are still babies, or buds, as they are called in flower land, they are so soft and tender that too much rain, or a cold wind, or a night of frost would do them harm. So nearly every, every flower has been given a warm covering which is folded closely around the tiny bud to protect it. 
Sometimes this calyx or covering is all in one piece like a cup and the bud sits safely inside. But very often it is made up of five or six or more pieces. And when this is the case, these separate pieces are called sepals. These sepals are often very green, like leaves, but you may have white sepals or yellow sepals or blue sepals or pink sepals. You will learn all about them after you know all that is in this flower book and are able to read a more difficult one. The third new word you must know the meaning of is petals. Nearly every flower has petals. They are the beautiful colored leaves of the flower that are within the calyx. It is these lovely petals, pink in the rose, yellow in the buttercup, red in the poppy, and blue in the forget-me-not that most of us mean when we talk of flowers. And it is these soft, silky petals which attract us, and not only us, but the birds and the bees and the butterflies, which all visit the gay flowers. These petals are among the most beautiful things in this wonderful world. Once Box Elder's prime spring perception with leaf out, which is occurring right about now in our world, uh, outside of the poem, outside. I know there's a lake that way and a very nice forest that way. Well, this room does not lead me to believe that. The hermit thrush may, for a moment, perch upon Dryad's saddle, and the dimmer flat light beneath will be scattered by shadows whose form proves incalculable to economic character. In our region, it is uncommon to find the water lotus far away from the banks of the largest rivers, unless it was planted to ornament the ideology which sprouts aesthetic perfection. In these instances, it is divine and forms extensive colonies blanketing the water with very large leaves. The stalk averages 18 inches in length, but may exceed 48 inches, as was recorded by Theophrastus, and of the bigness of one's finger like a soft reed, but without joints. The flower of the lotus is almost unimaginable in its relative grace, poised centrally above a round head called a ciborium, whose form is not unlike the comb which wasps do make, wherein is contained 30 cells, in the center of which grows a bean, whose top sits above, though subtly above, the cell in which it is contained. The bean is best enjoyed in a fresh green state and is often delicious when tempered in rose water. At dusk, the lotus withdraws its flower into the water and reemerges again the next morning, where it ascends to a height of, of three feet above the surface and as though witnessing its own perfection, expands its petals into the charged air. Okay, now I'm going to move to the first trifold. Uh, it believes, uh, I believe it begins, I believe my circumstances. And I'm trying to monitor my time here. I don't know how long I've been reading. Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> Andy's into endurance. <laughs> I am not so much. Uh, so I really want to read you uh, this section about the hummingbird uh, that Peter Kolm wrote, who is a Swedish naturalist. Uh, and so I've changed a little part of the text in this trifold uh, to make it uh, worth my doing. Why don't I just read it to you? I think it, wait, wait, no, 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 okay. So the start, 
I believe my circumstances are well known to me beneath fluttering poplar leaves. It's the fluttering which brings me there. October the 24th, uh, 1750. So he's in Philadelphia area. I'm gonna move around for this. You guys still hear me when I'm away from the mic? Does that, yeah. does that work all right? Okay. While they are sucking the juices of the flowers, they never settle on them, but flutter continually like bees, bend their feet backwards and move their wings so quick they are hardly visible. During this fluttering, they hum like bees or make a sound like the turning of a little spinning wheel. After they have thus, without resting, fluttered for a while, they fly to a neighboring tree or post and rest a while. They return to their humming and sucking. They are not very shy, and I, in company with several other people, have been not fully two yards from the place where they fluttered about and sucked the flowers. And though we spoke and moved, they were in no way disturbed. But on going towards them, they would fly off with the swiftness of an arrow. When several of them were on the same bed, there was always a violent combat between them in meeting each other at the same flower. For envy was likewise predominant among these little creatures. They attacked with such impetuosity that it would seem as if the strongest bill would pierce its antagonist through and through with its long bill. During the fight, they seemed to stand in the air, keeping themselves up by incredible swift motion of their wings. When the windows towards the garden are open, they pursue each other into the rooms, fight a little, and flutter away again. Sometimes they come to a flower which is withering and has no more juice in it. Then they, they then, in a fit of anger, pluck it off and throw it on the ground, that it may not mislead them in the future. It's incredible. If a garden contains a great number of these little birds, they are seen to pluck off the flowers in such quantities that the ground is quite covered with them. And it seems as if this proceeded from envy. Thanks uh, for letting me read that. Uh, beneath fluttering poplar leaves, it is a delicious evening to gravitate toward data that resembles my own. The producer frames every pore of my serenity as I push my canoe away from the dock with a lucky paddle. I must admit to my satisfaction with the inward creation. Marsh wrens clacking in the marsh, lotuses enmeshed in backwater substrate, and the sky reflected in scale upon the water. As my vessel floats among the lotuses, their leaves are pushed below the surface. And upon returning to my airy place, they act in accordance with their natural histories by shedding dusk water from their leaves. Disturbed by my presence, blackbirds rustle together in cattails, harmonize with serviceable purposes, and scatter upward, contented by practical wisdom. Just a field guide earmarked to the red-winged blackbird, if anyone wishes to take a look. I am convinced the most fruitful and melancholy purpose may be found in any natural object. When I imagine the sandhill crane tethered to the world's surface, I desire to perceive every unaccountable gift in nature like an otherness so swollen and sweet it cannot resist the option to befriend my ruptured spirit. If I stay out paddling beyond daylight, the upland follows will redress with darkness and having already departed from the realm of material beings, I will become my own useful place. Passing between spaces of daylight and memory, the placement of images within my body and time, I know there is interpretation inside of you. 
because I know there is interpretation inside of me. The hemlocks endorse their own darkness through this darkness of mine. Do not carry your noise in mind beneath this yellow birch. Three piles of soil for the boy who plays with red spades and buckets and firelight. Senses of self if loons wail. Loon actuates loon. Summer undresses tailored containers, leaves water body to a presentation in nature writing. Eco, 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 tuning, 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 affect. Eco touring white pine, diameter at breast height, 3.2 feet. If, while large pine is spared, the broad-leaved or other smaller trees around it are felled, the swaying of the tree from the action of the wind mechanically produces separations between the layers of annual growth and greatly diminishes the value of the timber. The same defect is often observed in pines, which from some accident of growth must have overtopped their fellows in the virgin forest. Senses of self if loons wail. Ricochet fear subsides like my body having come from there in motion beside you, because of you. To saunter near camp having been together with our influences against such importance. To long for a time with movement out of our world as movement away from our myth around language and appearances bridging the narrower streams of our conversation. So I think I'm closing in at around a half hour, which is where I wanted to end and left myself a little bit of space. So as my mouth grows perpetually dry, from all this language. Uh, I'm going to end with uh, the footnote uh, that's on the inside of the two-page spread, footnote 64, which comes from the 64th page of uh, my copy of John Bartram's Travels, uh, who was a contemporary of uh, Peter Kalm. Uh, and uh, Peter has a lot of nice things to say about John Bartram uh, in his book, that he was basically a, a self-taught genius uh, who was one of those classic uh, American figures who uh, taught himself to read Latin and then uh, read all of his Latin books. And I don't know how much of that is true, uh, but he's a self-taught naturalist, and so I really admire that. Uh, this was a fine day, and our traveling cool because shady, and the gooseberries being now ripened we were every now and then tempted to break off a bough and divert ourselves with picking them, though on horseback. This morning was clear and cool, and now our journey was truly charming. It is scarce possible to think the advantage we had in returning from the single circumstance of being free from those small gnats that tormented us in our going so grievously. But our return being mostly in the same path, it will be needless to describe the land or its productions again. Thanks. Uh, if anyone needs to leave, you should uh, leave. I, I know some people have tight schedules and uh, I was going to open it up if anyone had any questions, uh, but sometimes people feel trapped by the Q&A because they need to go somewhere. Uh, so if you need to go, I don't mind, uh, but we are uh, going to do a quick Q&A. And if anyone doesn't have any questions, we're going to speed ahead to the next thing.